Good week, good week. We made it to another another week, everybody. And, and truly is good to see everyone. And ah, man. As a church, if you've been with us as a church, we've been walking through the, the Sermon on the Mount this year. And one of the things we, we've talked about a lot, but uh, it's worth repeating again, is, is back in Jesus' day, the religious leaders, uh, specifically the, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, they, they thought Jesus was not taking the commands in the Torah seriously enough, right? I mean, Jesus... And you read through the Gospels and you get to see why. I mean, Jesus often would kind of play fast and loose with, with the Sabbath, right? Uh, on Sabbath, he would, he would heal people on the Sabbath, almost just to ruffle people's feathers. And, and, um, and again, Jesus, at, at this stage in Matthew 5, he really hadn't shown any of his cards yet on any of the controversial topics of his day. Sure, he had the huge crowds and everything, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees are like, well, he hasn't dove into this topic yet or that topic yet. And again, big topics that were in the air around 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. So in the Sermon on the Mount, right here in this section that we're in, Jesus then starts showing his cards, right? He has six sayings in this section that start something like, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, right? Like, you've heard it said, da-da-da, but I say, da-da-da, right? And, and um, we've already looked at two of those, um, and, and both of the ones we've looked at come from the Ten Commandments. You, you shall not, you do, do not murder, do not commit adultery. Today, we're going to look at the third one, but this one doesn't come from the Ten Commandments. It actually comes from an obscure law in Deuteronomy chapter 24, buried deep in, in that. A law that addresses when, it, it, when is it appropriate for a man to divorce his wife. So now this question was very much in the air at the time of Jesus. Under what exact circumstances can I divorce my wife? Jesus doesn't shy away from this, but rather he dives headfirst into this messy topic, controversy. And so let's, let's just look at Matthew 5, 31 and 32, two verses that we're going to look at. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, the, the lines that I just read there in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, about ma Jesus' words on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, they have had a huge influence on the course of millions of people's lives throughout history. There is a diversity of views on the implications of what we just said, what, what Jesus just said, we heard. What does he actually mean there? And then just like pastorally, like how do you pastor people with like that, with that as a, as a headway? So in a section where Jesus is showing his cards, showing the, the greater righteousness, a greater, higher calling of doing right by others, right, that's not just focused on the external that, that the Pharisees were all about, but the internal stuff, Jesus decides to wade into this, right? He decides to put his finger right in it, and, and, and somehow there is something underneath this, right? Jesus wouldn't just do this for no reason. There's something here that Jesus is effectively saying, people are not doing right here. People are, we're not doing something 
And he finds it big enough to, to bring up and, and talk about it. He feels that, that we need God's wisdom here. And so he begins, again, by, by not talking about one of the big Ten Commandments, but, but going to this obscure law buried in Deuteronomy chapter 24, where it talks about a man giving a woman a certificate of divorce. And we're going to get there. Don't, don't worry. But, but um, what, what I find beautiful, what truly, truly beautiful is, okay, so in Matthew chapter 5, we've just, you know, boom, we've got these two just deep, dense, just two verses not a lot of context that you catch. That it's just like you've heard it said, and boom, I say this. And it's like, whoa. And then what's beautiful is in the same book of the Bible, in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, we have a longer story, lots of context, and Jesus is, is hitting this same thing but we have more words, right? We get, we get more context. And, and it, again, it's found in the same book. So we as Bible readers, we should be saying yay to this. I did. I said yay to this because, because I think if we figure out what's going on in Matthew 19, it'll help clarify what we just read in Matthew chapter 5, okay? So if you got your Bibles, you can open them to Matthew 19. If you got a phone, you can go there, or, or it'll, it'll be up here on the screens. Thank you, Ann. So here we go. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. I love that. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They said, is it lawful or, or is it legal in the Torah? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Okay, now this, pause, <laughs> pause here. This is a test. Matthew just said that this is a test, that the Pharisees are testing Jesus. Uh, and it's not even like, hey, Jesus, tell us your, your position on divorce. Specifically, it, it is, what is your view on the any reason divorce? Okay? It's not even a genuine question, right? That This is what... Whatever happens when a famous person gets asked at a press conference a, a gotcha question, it's, it's something like that, where, where it's so loaded, there's no way to win here. It's such a controversial issue. Anything you say will categorize you um, and divide the room, and no one else will hear anything after your words are spoken here. I mean, that's the type of question that is being asked. It's a loaded thing. It's to discredit Jesus and his reputation. It may even, I was thinking about this, I mean, think about, this is the type of question that got John the Baptist in prison and later beheaded, right? I mean, it's in that realm, and so maybe they were just like saying, hey, it worked for John. Let's just see if we can't, again, trick Jesus or get him to say something, maybe divide the, the he's got crowds. That's obvious, but, but what does he say about this super specific, super loaded question? And so, and we, and we have to go to Deuteronomy 24. So, so in this sermon, just heads up, we're going to be going down all the way. Okay, so buckle up. Because we, we started Matthew 5, we went to Matthew 19. Now we're, we have to go to Deuteronomy, or yeah, Deuteronomy 24. So that's where we're going to go. Because we got to see what is, what's he talking about, right? Okay, so Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, it says this. 
If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, why? Well, because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and then sends her away from the house. Okay, now, that's it, okay? It, it goes on further from there, but, but this is what we're dealing with. Now, back then, well, you have to remember, there's all these rabbis, right? There's all these rabbis. They're, they're, they're teachers of the law. They love the law. They've got disciples under them, and they've got, effectively, they've got schools. I mean, people come to hear them talk about the law. Obscure things in the law. This is, this is one of them, okay? And there was, there was a guy named Rabbi Shammai. Now, he views Deuteronomy 24, 1, finding something indecent. Well, what does that mean? That's the big question. What does that mean? He thinks that it means that the husband finds out or sees the, the, the woman commit adultery, right? She, she is sleeping with someone other than him, okay? And that, under Rabbi Shammai and under Deuteron Deuteronomy 24, one means that you can get a divorce. You can serve her divorce papers for that specific thing. Now, there was another school of thought, a big school of thought, Rabbi Hillel, the house of Hillel, he quotes the same Deuteronomy 24.1 from the Torah, but he understands the clause as, as way broader, right? Rabbi Shammai was adultery. Rabbi Hillel was way broader. Essentially, if she spoiled the food, I, I kid you not, that is, in the, uh, that is what they thought. If she spoiled the food or if the food was bad, that is one example of a reason for a husband to give the divorce papers to his wife. And many, I'm seeing the wives, their eyes are big. Yeah, yeah, they should be big. That's like, whoa, wow. And, and, and okay, so listen to this. Of the 613 laws, of the, in the Torah, only two of them have anything to say about divorce. Okay, so, 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 so that means there's lots of room for interpretation, right? And both of and, and we looked at one of them, right? We looked at Deuteronomy 24.1. And notice, it doesn't, it talks about divorce, but not directly. It's sort of indirectly. It just kind of says in yeah, you can do this because you found something displeasing. What is it that's displeasing? We don't know. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's a good example that the laws of the Torah don't represent the constitution of ancient Israel. Okay, like the, there is still that needs worked out. And, and different rabbis thought different things. And th this rabbi says this and this and this. And... and because seriously, what are the grounds of divorce? Like, this is a huge deal. This is huge implications. How you, how you land on it and what you teach about it directly. I mean, lives and livelihoods are affected by where you land on, is it, is it super broad or is it super narrow? And so the Pharisees are asking Jesus this question. And, and again, it's important to note, they're not asking, Jesus, are, are there any legitimate re grounds for divorce? They're not even asking that. They, they are asking him, tell us what you think about Deuteronomy 24.1. I mean, Jesus, what, what are your thoughts here? Again, to divide the room, Split his followers. This is a hot topic. There's not a lot of clarity in the Torah. So whatever Jesus' response is here, 
just know this is not Jesus' complete teachings on the matter of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You just have to know that. He's answering a loaded, specific question to trap him. Now, before we go any further, I want us to bring to mind the Samaritan woman again. Remember her? She's there at the well. It's a hot day. At noon, Jesus is having a conversation with her about living water. Remember? Living water. She says, sir, I would love to taste that water you speak of. Jesus says to her, go, call your husband and come back. She says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. When we hear that story as modern readers, we assume a lot, don't we? A nice word would be promiscuous. But remember Rabbi Hillel's view? Like, what if she just wasn't a good cook? Like, honest to God. What, what if she just messed up once? And then she gets a divorce. Then she gets a reputation. And th There is so many scenarios on why she was divorced five times. We have no idea. There is literally two ways to read that story. We've only read it one way, haven't we? What if there's a whole other way to read it? That it wasn't, she wasn't promiscuous. Like, have you ever even thought about that? Going back to Jesus' response to this very loaded question in Matthew 19. In, what, man, Jesus is just <laughs> amazing. Because this, watch what he does. Instead of going where they want him to go, Deuteronomy 24.1, he goes even further back. He goes to page 1 and 2 of the Bible. That's where he goes. And, and, and if we could put... Verse 4, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made the male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. For Jesus... The marriage covenant between a husband and wife is like it, uh, is one way, one powerful way for human beings to image God, right? Like, like in, in a lot of ways, this, this one flesh, yet two distinct people, but they are one flesh. It's a lot how, again, I know many of you thought about the Trinity today. We sang about the Trinity today, this idea that that we serve one God in three unique, separate, distinct persons. the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And yet, they are not three gods. They are one God in three, right? And, and so too, a, a man and wife, a husband and wife are two and yet one flesh. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful and and. How Jesus views marriage and how we view God are interconnected. And, and, and the Apostle Paul, back in Ephesians 5, is talking about marriage. He's talking about husbands loving their wives and wives respecting their husbands. And then all of a sudden, in, in uh, verse 31, we read this. For, for this reason, this is Ephesians 5, 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, so there's Genesis again, one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. <laughs> like, so, so the Apostle Paul 
is, is like writing about marriage, but in his mind, as he's writing about marriage, his mind just goes right into Jesus Christ and the church. Like, like, like it, it, it's just in his mind, those two are just so, so connected. It's, it's wonderful. And I think Paul's connected like that because he knew the Hebrew scriptures so well. He knew him so well. And what I find endlessly fascinating is in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew scriptures, specifically the prophets, right? The prophets, they, especially Ezekiel and Hosea, they would routinely use the metaphor of Israel being an adulteress, right? Like this adulteress chasing after other gods. Right and and uh, specifically Ezekiel sixteen, where God uses this vivid imagery of God lovingly raising Israel, caring for Israel, clothing, feeding Israel, to care of her, put a ring on her finger, and then and then Israel turns away and pursues false gods, and and literally the word is adultery. Israel is adulterous to God. That's how God feels. And yet God chases after her, loves her, is faithful to Israel. Why? Because of his character and because of his covenant. The covenant is a big, big deal to God. He does not, it's not a light thing for God to break his covenant. It's a big, big thing. So, so now, come with me back to Matthew 19. I, I know we're kind of going everywhere, but back to Matthew 19. Jesus goes to page one and two of the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. The creation prototype, one man, one woman, one flesh. What God has joined together, let man not separate. Then the, the Pharisees push back, verse seven. In Matthew 19, verse 7, why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Jesus knows that because we are fallen state, because we've sinned, we've allowed sin into this world, his good world, we're sinful creatures and we cannot do the ideal perfectly. We can't. And so God, God's prophet Moses gave a concession, uh, but he did not do this because God wanted this, but just, hey, he's working with what he's got, right? It's our hearts were hard, our hearts so the human tendency is not to stay loyal. Jesus is showing us his cards. He's clearly in the Shammai camp, very, you know, not broad, right? But just adultery, adultery. Be loyal. Loyalty is the lens for, through which we see any provision in cases where divorce, divorce might happen or divorce, divorce might be pursued. Instead of fo focusing on loyalty, our, our hearts go to, like when marriage gets hard, our hearts go hard. And, and we tend to look for the exit signs and, you know, and we tend to ask, yeah, but when exactly is divorce permissible? What's the grounds? Like, we would love that. We, we would love that. Let, let's create a rule book, right? A rule book for, for when and how and why and that's what we want. That's what we want. But, but when we actually take a look at what Jesus says, when pressed, when he's in this hot argument, it's not about rules. It's more about centering on the picture of the ideal, lifting up the ideal, a picture of covenant loyalty, faithfulness to the other. It's the ideal. Just as God is faithful to you, just as God is loyal to you, just as God has not forsaken you, given up on you, we are to be loyal to our spouse. Now, none of this is easy. 
None of this is cut and dry. None of this is not messy. Because what if the spouse hasn't committed adultery, yet is still failing to act in covenant love? Right? Like, what happens then? Oh, so let's go, let's go even deeper. Like, there's, there's a deepness here. The Apostle Paul seems to make even more concessions in his letter to 1 Corinthians, right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which again makes sense because the epistles, the, the letters we have in our Bible, the way they function, the, the letters, the way they function is it's, it's a newer context, right, uh, of what was hammered out in the four Gospels. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and we have just different vantage points of Jesus doing amazing things. But then we have the letters, and the letters are a whole new context because we, we've got Gentiles and Jewish people and the church. We've got this new thing, and, and the letters are, okay, how can we take what we know from the Gospels into this new context? this new reality. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul starts off by saying, and now to the matters you wrote about, or you asked me about, which, so the Corinthian church had some questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And, and Paul's finally, it took him seven chapters, but he's finally getting to that. And in verse 10 and 12, he says, a couple of times he says, I, not the Lord, say, which essentially means I, Paul, want to carry on the conversation that the Lord Jesus Christ started in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19. That's what he's saying. And, but, but now it's in your context, right? Now it's, now it's in your context where you have Let's say you, are, and, this, and Corinthians had this, you had a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse. A believing spouse heard the gospel, said yes, and the unbelieving spouse is against the gospel for some reason. What do you do then? Right, that's, that's what 1 Corinthians 7 is about. Or, again, we, there was this, there was, what if a, a marriage, a spouse just up and leaves, just deserts? The other spouse, what, what about the covenant then? I mean, yeah, adultery hadn't happened, but they just straight up and left. Paul, what do we, what do, we do then? That's all 1 Corinthians 7. And there's, Paul leaves room for that. There's nuance there. And now what about today in our context? Right? I mean, you all know since 1960s, the sexual revolution and the 70s and the 80s, you all know the statistic, right? I mean, right now, I, I, I Googled it up, and right about 45% of all marriages end in divorce. If the couple are believers, that number's down a little bit, but not as much as I'd like it. I'm just, we're just, let's be honest. Let's, um, and so we all know couples. We all know family members, friends, dear friends, people at work that have gone through a divorce for all kinds of reasons, some big, some small, all hard. So in one sense, I mean, we just, need to hear Jesus emphasize the ideal, lift up the ideal, like just as a culture, we need to hear the ideal preached and, and, and brought up. Covenant loyalty should last longer than I think or feel like I, I yeah, or feel like it. The, the promises and vows that, that I made to, to God and, and, and my witnesses, my friends, my family should matter. May you hear me say that that is the message that needs to be preached just, just because our culture is where it is with marriage and divorce. The ideal needs to be said. And also, and also, Jesus and Paul 
leave room for nuance. Because there might be cases, and there are cases, where adultery was not committed, but the covenant really and truly was shattered. That just, we have to go there. We have to think about that and talk about that. Now, we don't have a chapter and a verse, maybe, because that's not what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 19, <laughs> right? And that wasn't what the debate they were having back then. So we must be very wise, right? Be thou my vision. Like we just have to like seek the Lord, be humble. And just like, oh, go to God and go to wise people. Go to your elders and just like, what, what do I do with this? This is really, really hard. May we not rely on our feelings or our knee-jerk reactions. Oh, that won't get us anywhere good, right? So, so listen, we, we've drilled down on this matter, and, and now I just want to kind of go back up to Matthew 5.31, right? Because I think we've drilled down but now we just need to hear the Lord speak to us again. Matthew 5, 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her, or give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I don't know if any of that's clearer now, but, but what I want to get at is remarriage is implied here because women had no power back then, folks. And, and so they had two choices, either go back to their family of origin, which, which we have a book in the Bible about that, beautiful book, the book of Ruth. So either that route or remarriage to survive. And because the woman could never, I mean, the woman could never file for divorce back then. There was no power to do that. So it's always the man giving her the divorce papers. She, the NIV translates what every Bible says, but not in these words, that she becomes the victim of divorce, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So the shocking statement, I always say there's a shocking statement with these Sermon on the Mount. It, it's that Jesus sides with Shammai, right? I mean, just that, that it, it's super, it's not broad. It's super narrow to protect the woman, to protect her. Jesus does allow for a concession, adultery. He doesn't say you have to take it. Even if adultery has happened, you don't have to take it. There can be forgiveness. There can be reconcil reconciliation. Look at God and Israel, right? I mean, just... So there can be reconciliation, but there doesn't have to be. So as I try and land the plane here, I, I never want to be in the habit of apologizing for Jesus, so, so I won't. I'm not going to. We need to hear this. We, we need to hear again the ideal. Maybe there's a marriage, maybe there's marriages that are hard right now. You're definitely looking at the exit signs, and there is no better text for a husband and wife to read and to look at and sit with than, than this one. Matthew, Matthew 19. And just hear it again. But listen, I also know that there on any given Sunday, there is there is hurt here. There is baggage here. There is pain here. There is different choices made and regrets. And there is just, just lots of trauma here with this text. 
And so, um, may I remind you of the grand story of the Bible, the story of a God whose heart is bent towards faithfulness, loyal love, a good God who has bound, binds himself to humans. And are, are we going to be perfect? No. Should, should we strive to be? Yes. And again, some of us have fallen short in this area and for all sorts of reasons. And I know there's hurt in this topic, but Jesus loves you. We love you. Jesus is, is here, just like the woman at the well. Like, I, I, we just kind of keep coming back to this, this woman. And I just love, like, Jesus acknowledges. And we don't even know. We, there's so much we don't know. But Jesus acknowledges the, the five husbands, doesn't shame her about it, doesn't rub her nose in it, just like, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know all about it. And I'm not going anywhere. Again, he, of all people, he tells her, <laughs> I'm, I'm the king. I'm the Messiah that you've always wondered about. I am him. And I want to give you living water, water that you won't run dry. And she just is on fire, and she goes and tells everybody, come to the one who's told me everything about me and loves me. <laughs> and loves me. Amen. Oh, man. And so, because that's what Jesus does, he comes to the discarded. He comes to the one that are beat up and bruised and, and trampled on and the powerless. He goes straight to them and loves them. He comes to the least and the last and the lost, and I just, <laughs> I love that. And I'm so thankful for that. And so let's pray. Oh, Jesus. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, God the Father, our three in one God. Lord, we've spent time in your word, and you, you showed your cards, Jesus. You, you, you put yourself right in the throes of a heated argument. You weren't afraid to go there, and you did it because we got off the rails. We... We were in the weeds. We, we, were, we were looking at all the excuses and reasons, and, and, and you lift up the ideal. And I just, I thank you for that. And God, I thank you that you grant us concessions, real concessions. For God, we are weak. We are frail in this area. And you met us right in the pain. And so thank you for that. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness when we are not loving and we're not faithful. Speak to our hearts once again, Lord, as we, as we look at this text again. Speak, Lord. Bid us to follow you, and we will follow you. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen.